Welcome to Oregon Voters Digest, the program that brings forward the social and political issues that are important to people living here in the Pacific Northwest. And now, your host, Bruce Broussard. My personal background is small town working class. At the age of 11, I began work with door-to-door sales and by my mid-30s had held dozens of mostly blue-collar jobs. And I have a technical degree in forestry. But although my heart has always yearned for chainsaws, heavy equipment, and to be part of a down-and-dirty construction crew, for the last 30 years I've been a CEO and job producer, the author of a best-selling business book, and a professional turnaround specialist who, in collaboration with my business partner, has assisted in the rescue, growth, and success of over 500 small businesses across the country. I'm a fixer and a builder, and like any good CEO, I have a talent for diving deep into the operation of a business to find what's not right, and to quickly take that business to super efficiency so it can provide great value for all involved, employees and customers. I'm passionate to lead the charge to do the same thing with Oregon's state government. There, there you are, folks. Um, this, is, this is who I'm with right now, Sam Carpenter. He's here in the studio with us. We were able to catch this guy. He was knocking on some doors. Uh, you know, we had Lincoln's birthday um, over the weekend here. He just happened to be in the Portland metropolitan area. And, hey, here he is right in the studio. Welcome aboard, Sam. Thank you, Bruce. Sounds great. Sounds great. Well, look, tell us right off the bat, um, one, what was your feel about uh, the Lincoln Day celebration piece? I understand you went to an affair. Yeah, Clackamas County was Clackamas a great okay. get together, okay. a couple hundred people and okay. Republicans and okay. fun and uh, upbeat and about four hours long. Okay, okay. You're the, <laughs> so you and the wife sort of stopped over there, right, and did yes. that piece, right, uh-huh. for a little bit aspect of it. Okay. Yeah. Uh-huh. Well, tell us a little bit about the campaign uh, in terms of you've been going around Oregon, you've been talking to different kinds of groups, if you will. What do you think? We've been all over the state. Okay, We've good. Been La Grande, okay. then the coast, and okay. back and forth and back and forth. Going very well. We're ahead in the polls. Mm-hmm. Zogby, mm-hmm. Triton, whatever. Mm-hmm. And uh, we've had a lot of fun talking to people. Mm-hmm. Talk, talk, talk. Uh, and it's been very successful so far, very satisfying. Mm-hmm. You know, we were talking, to, we were just, uh, a couple things about uh, the area here and this area here. Home, homeless is one of the major issues here within the Portland metropolitan area, Multnomah County, you know, in this tri-county mm-hmm. area. It's pretty heavy. We've got the border of Washington right over here, and they're constantly mm-hmm. coming over here, and it's costing us all kinds of issues and headaches. I'm sure you, you know, I'm sure you probably have, have gotten the same hit from other folks around the state and whatever, but can you talk a little bit about uh, homelessness and what do you think might be a solution to our problems that we're having? What do you think? Steve Forbes says that prosperity, when you have prosperity, a lot of good things happen. Yeah, yeah. So the base of this is not homelessness. The base is there's no opportunity for people. If you've got somebody on the street, and a lot of these are kids, a lot of these are 20-year-olds, and they're... There's drugs involved Mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. a big percentage of the time. Mm -hmm. But the thing is, if there were jobs out there and they paid $20 an hour, Mm -hmm. as they should, according to inflation, Mm -hmm. if you go back 30 years and come back forward, a kid able to find a job and make $20, $25 an hour Mm -hmm. is going to be a little more serious about his or her life. Mm -hmm. And so a booming economy will help enormously to take care of this. The other thing is, as a conservative, there's this personal responsibility thing. Mm-hmm. And uh, the more we put roofs over people's heads, the more we take care of their every need, the harder it is for them to want to step out of that. Mm-hmm. So uh, it's a multifaceted solution. Mm-hmm. And it doesn't have to do with not caring about these folks. It has to do with giving them opportunity, opportunity. actually. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And so uh, it's multifaceted, and I have to say, I need to get inside the machine, the mm-hmm. machine, the government machine, and look at it a little harder. But those are some general ideas, a couple of general yeah. ideas, yeah. Bruce. Now, what about job? I'm thinking about, there's always been this, this thing about the fact that many manufacturers move their plants and their, their business, those jobs out of our country, uh, out of the country here. And, but what about Oregon? Have you seen them? Uh, know of uh, maybe some of the businesses that have actually have not been here before, and now you're looking at possibly getting them back here? Of course. Those jobs? So our tax rate 
corporate tax rate is very yeah. high okay. here. And this is, <laughs> we could say it's not a right to work state, mm -hmm. or we could say it's a pay to work state. This is a pay to work state. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. so uh, what I want to see is a loosening up of somebody's ability to bring their uh, manufacturing into the state and not have to pay huge uh, we don't want our workers to have to belong to a union. Mm -hmm. That's mm -hmm. the thing. And the more you have a situation where workers have to belong to the union, the more these companies are going to go out of the state. Mm -hmm. Now, we've beat that to death. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think that uh, with the Janus decision, Supreme Court Janus decision this spring, May or June, it's going to punch a big hole in that. Mm -hmm. And, it, and we, we are going to be a right-to-work state, as every state in the country is going mm -hmm. to be by summer. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Now, I guess on that same issue, prevailing wage has always been the issue. You know, everybody's got to eat, right? You know what I'm, I'm sure you've probably taken that in consideration. You know, I'm just from the standpoint uh -huh. that maybe it's like anything else. Families are very important, right? And the fact of the matter is, it's like anything get, keeping things over their head. In our in our city right here, mm -hmm. I mean, people are being driven out of their homes right here uh -huh. because the fact of the matter is, just it's just too costly mm -hmm. to maintain. And many of those seniors, if you will, that were here that have worked their butt off, if you will, to, to get their little home, and all of a sudden they just be, it, you just can't afford it anymore. Is that something that you may want to consider looking at or whatever? Of course. Okay. But you've got to go a layer deeper. Why are we having these okay. problems? And the high cost of housing has to do with bad zoning mm -hmm. and uh, restrictions on building. It makes it expensive. And then these poor folks can't find jobs. This all has to do with government interference, mm -hmm. government getting into every nook and cranny and really messing up the free enterprise system. Mm -hmm. Now, one of the elements here, and I'll just bring it up as an example, is very few young people, I'm saying 16, 17, 18 years of age, can find a job now. Mm -hmm. Because the minimum has to be way up here, and a right. lot of those kids, a lot of those kids would like to have a job and pay less if yeah. they just want a job. Mm -hmm. And it isn't a matter of patting the wallets of fat cats. It's about giving kids an opportunity to find out what it's like to work. I have a business where people come in uh, with a bachelor's degree to come to work for me, and they've never had a job. Oh, wow. And I have to say to them. Do you know what to do in a job? Yeah. No, they really yeah. don't. They don't yeah. know what to do, and yeah. so there's a lot of missed opportunity there. And this idea that, well, I, we have to have a living wage. Well, that's great. Well, what if you don't have a wage at all, mm -hmm. which is the condition mm -hmm. that we have? Mm -hmm. Well, you know what? Uh, this is good. In fact, I'm, I know that you're going to hopefully be back in the area here that we can talk a little bit more about that because there is, mm -hmm. for some strange reason, there is a gap between uh, getting our leadership from a business standpoint mm -hmm. and the and the employees aspect of it. We do, people need to get back into our economy and work this thing up. So it's going to be a pleasure uh, with you on the, on, the, on the trail right now. Uh, you're going to be able to communicate that and not like to talk to you about some more issues along that line. That Anytime, okay Bruce. That sounds you good. Bet. Well, good. Thanks very much for coming by, dropping by Portland, Oregon. Huh. Keep on, how's the wife doing? She's doing okay? Yeah, she's okay. Okay, good enough. She's sounds, right over there. Sounds great. Okay. <laughs> we're going to go on and uh, we're going to jump right into this next issue here at this point in time. Thank you. Like I say, we've got the gubernatorial candidate Sam Carpenter. Thank you, governor. Bruce. Okay, buddy. Take care. Have a good one now. Well, Dan, Dan was going to come, but we, we want to get want to get through with him. Dan, okay, good. Nope, nope. There's a chair there. We got one. We got one. No, you you okay, Dan? Yeah. We're just going to get you on the end, buddy. Yeah. Um, Where you want to sit, buddy? Uh, we're, not, we're, we're not. We're not ready yet. If you're not ready yet, I'll go down and get him out the way five or ten minutes. What are you ready? I'm you, ready. Come on, buddy. Come on. As somebody who values Dan. freedom, I like Bruce Cuff. Hi, I'm Bruce Cuff. I'm a Christian, constitutional, conservative Republican. Conservative, constitutional, he's honest. Uh, we need to have private schools. We need to have vouchers. We need school choice. In this election, I am the conservative, Second Amendment supporter, pro-life, and we want to get Oregon back on track. I need your vote in this primary election. The biggest backers of this governor is all the public employees unions. She's pushing the agenda but when it comes to everyday Oregonians that are trying to get up, go to work every day, work hard, pay their bills, pay their taxes, get their kids educated, it's just not working. Yeah. Um, and and the, the other thing is the school system. I mean, we have gone from $10,000 a student two years ago to over $13,000 a student 
just two years later, wow. and we still have a failed system. We need to have school choice in Oregon. We need every single parent, regardless of their economic income, to be able to have a choice on where their kids go to school and what their kids are taught. Our general fund is made up, 90% of it is made up of personal income taxes, mm -hmm. and there's a small portion of it that's government. So when we increase tax, or a small portion which is business taxes, if, when we increase the taxes on businesses and they move out of state and they, they take those jobs with them, I mean, we're just going backwards. We're Oregon to say, we're gonna be a sanctuary state and we're gonna have none of our law enforcement officers working with immigration or the ICE uh, folks, that's, that's unlawful, it's unconstitutional. We have a governor who is so far left and she has a specific agenda and it's very narrow mm -hmm. um, and she's pushing an Oregon that is, is not for most of Oregonians. And um, I think we, we, we need to have our businesses uh, and our schools be something that we can be proud of in Oregon. And right now, um, a lot of businesses are looking at other places to go, and the school system is still failing even though we put more and more and more money into it. There just is no accountability there. Mm -hmm. um, and um, as, a, as a, a father and a grandfather, I want my kids to be able to stay in Oregon, mm -hmm. in Oregon to be a place where we have good wage jobs and where, where kids can prosper. Folks, as you can see, we, we picked up another gubernatorial candidate, uh, and that was Bruce Cuff, just to make sure he got his in, because he's walking and knocking on doors all over the place. He's been all over the state for that matter. He's gone, it's my understanding, he's gone to every county in the state of Oregon. Boy, is he a worker. Trust me. You've seen him before. In fact, check out the archives of the Oregon Voters Digest, and you get a, even a, even a, uh, another another set aside, if you will, of Bruce Cuff. Okay, and if we have enough time, we might bring it on here live. He's still knocking on doors. He's still outside right now, still knocking on some doors, talking to folks. But but after we get through with this particular guest, we may have Bruce just stick his head back up in here, out of sight. Okay, fine. Well, guess what? We've got a very important piece this time around, and I'm talking about um, campaign finance along that particular line, and, and the whole issue of uh, of how does um, how do we control, if you will, the kinds of monies that pretty well, pretty well, well, does this to be up front with? Buying a seat, you know, just buying a candidate and, and whether or not that is the best way, if you will, of getting the kind of leadership that we need to deal with the issues. I'm just kind of like throwing something out. Dan, you've seen Dan here before on the Oregon Voters Digest, but the whole issue is that um, uh, in our process, we're looking for leadership to deal with the issues for, for whatever area, but for whatever situation it is. And um, and so I'll let Dan sort of explain and give up the rationale as to why he got into this particular situation here, talking to this issue. And uh, and, and then he can talk specifically to the county, because I think that's where you know, the county and the city, he's got he's got something that he's already, in, in, he's, let's see, he's imposed it, he's put it, he's put it on the table, and there's been some kind of glitches, whatever, and, and the and the in, in it has stopped it. They wouldn't they wouldn't accept it, but the people voted it in, and then now all of a sudden we were that was Multnomah County, and then now with the city of Portland, he's trying to basically do the same thing. But anyway, this is why we did. Dan, welcome right. aboard. Okay, Thank you, buddy. Bruce. All right, good. I'm Thanks. glad you're here, buddy, because it, it's really much needed. They're going to be closing the door very shortly come March, if, as far as candidates are concerned. So this is a very, very important issue. So please pay attention. Okay, Dan, right. welcome again, the board. Okay. Let's well, talk about the deal. How'd you get into this deal? Why? Well, I got into it because I was uh, representing utility rate payers in various rate cases at the, Calif at the uh, Oregon Public Utility Commission. And I found that if I, if I won a case and then, or I won in the court of Oregon courts, mm -hmm. uh, you know, got findings that the utilities were breaking the law and, and charging rates that were too high and illegal rates, then the utilities let, would just run over to the Oregon legislature and get the law changed retroactively. Mm. It's because they had so much, they, they were funding so many of the legislators, the legislators did whatever they wanted to, and that was both Republicans and Democrats overwhelmingly would vote in favor of what the utilities wanted to do. So it occurred to me that 
nothing can be really, no progress can be made on consumer protection or, or environmental protection or uh, issues like fair taxation as long as our politicians can be, uh, is, are basically up to the highest bidder. And Oregon is only is one of only six states with no limits at all on really? campaign contributions. Wow. We'll get into this a little bit more. What I'd like to start with, though, is this slide, which I, I always like to contradict the host's previous guest. Okay, yes. Your previous guest said Oregon corporate taxes were very high. In fact, Oregon corporate taxes are extremely low. Uh, this first chart is from the um, uh, study by the Tax Foundation that indicates that Oregon's business taxes are, in fact, tied with Connecticut for the lowest, okay. and that was based on 2014. And then they updated the study in 2015 and found that Oregon's overall business taxes were the second lowest in America, uh, lower only, the, lower on, the only lower was Oklahoma, okay. a little bit lower. It's on the screen now, yeah. And this reflects our campaign finance system. It's the corporations that make the big contributions to candidates, and so right. they have to pay attention to them. In Oregon, you can't really, if you're, a, if you're a public office holder, you can't afford to alienate any big corporation because any big corporation can suddenly fund your opponent to an unlimited degree, even a million dollars if they want to. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, the, um, the converse of that, or I guess the other side of it, is that Oregon is extremely high when it comes to uh, income taxes on the working poor. This slide indicates that Oregon ranks second highest in the country in the share of state and local taxes paid by individuals, and Oregon has the third highest income taxes in the country for a family of four uh, earning 100, at 125% of the poverty line. Hmm. Now, guess what? Though the folks living at the poverty line or, or slightly above it aren't making a lot of campaign contributions, so they get high taxes in Oregon rather than the low taxes that Oregon corporations get. Hmm. And those taxes are, in fact, um, there are bills at the Oregon legislature uh, that will make this in this session, which just started a couple of days ago, that will actually make the corporation taxes uh, go down even further. Really? Oh, yeah. Um, this is... Um, you know, the, the, the bankruptcy of Oregon's campaign finance system is well recognized around the country. This slide is from the uh, state integrity investigation of the Center for Public Integrity, um, which in about two years ago determined that um, Oregon rated an F on virtually every measure of fighting corruption in state government. <laughs> um, the only thing that they did not get an F in, they got a D minus in legislative accountability. <laughs> Um, then they then ranked all of the states in terms of how good or bad their systems were in ca for campaign finance regulation. And they determined that Oregon was the second worst in America. Hmm. Can you guess which hmm. state was worse? Yeah, not California. Only Mississippi. Mississippi. Go Only Mississippi. Yeah, yeah. That's right. Oregon <laughs> is the worst what? when it comes to campaign finance regulation. Only Mississippi is rated worse by the state integrity investigation. of The Center for Public Integrity is a very uh, well-respected and, and long-term uh, organization for uh, in, you know, looking into things. Um, one, this indicates, this next chart indicates the, the massive increase in spending, and this is just for candidates for the Oregon legislature. Mm -hmm. It's gone up from, this is total campaign spending for them, it's gone up from uh, about little under four million dollars in 1996 mm -hmm. to about 30 million dollars in the last two election cycles mm -hmm. and the interesting thing about that is that most races for the Oregon legislature involve no almost no money at all no money most no money because most of them are in districts that are either overwhelmingly Democratic registration uh -huh. or overwhelmingly Republican registration mm -hmm. so there are no contests in about a third of all races in Oregon for the legislature, one there's only one major party on the ballot in November because the other party doesn't bother to run anybody. Mm -hmm. um, there are um, very also very few primary fights. That is, incumbents very rarely face anyone mm -hmm. in, in the primary of their own party. The, um, the spending in Oregon governor's races has also increased dramatically, as you can see uh, from mm -hmm. this chart, from about $2 million to over $20 million. In... So the spending in Oregon legislative races is really focused on just a few races. That is, uh, maybe there are three or four competitive races for the Oregon Senate okay. in every cycle. Maybe there are 10 competitive races for the, for out of the 60 seats in the Oregon House. And so this shows that the amount that's spent by the top 10 candidates, and this is each, each one of them average, mm -hmm. for the Oregon House in the last uh, election was $825,000 each. 
for an Oregon House seat. And remember, these seats can be won with as few as about 11,000 votes. So we're talking about $80 per vote is being spent in order to win races in the Oregon House. And like, like a state, like a state, which one? Like, like, can you give us a sampling? Like, which state? This which is, which this office? Is, uh, every, this is the top 10 um, candidates for the Oregon House of Representatives. Okay, okay. These are in, these basically are in the Portland, Portland? suburbs. Oh, really? Okay. Uh, and uh, in a couple of districts up and down the Willamette Valley where Repu where there's no overwhelming Democratic registration or no overwhelming okay. Republican registration. And so the, the, the top candidates are now in both the House and Senate routinely spending over a million dollars each on their campaigns. Um, this gives Oregon the most expensive races for the legislature of any state other than New Jersey. At least that's what the, Oregon, the Portland Oregonian newspaper says. And of course, if you're in New Jersey, if you're in northern New Jersey, you have to buy into the New York City media market. Mm -hmm. If you're in southern New Jersey, you have to buy into the Philadelphia media market. Mm -hmm. But Portland, but Oregon almost outstrips New Jersey in the cost of elections, the amount spent in order to win seats in, in, mm -hmm. the, in the legislature. Okay. Oregon's not only bad when it comes to lack of limits on contributions or expenditures, it's also rated, ranked an F when it comes to disclosure of, of the sources of money in political ads. Washington, by the way, ranks by the Corporate Reform Coalition, ranks uh, rates an A. Uh, Oregon, however, is an F. Oregon used to have a statute that required every, cam every campaign ad to at least identify its source. Mm -hmm. um, but the Oregon legislature uh, in 2001 conveniently repealed that statute. <laughs> there was one person who testified against repealing it, and that was me. You. That was me. They repealed it, and uh, it was a Republican majority legislature at the time, but it was a Democratic governor. It was Governor Kitzhaber who signed that bill. Of course, we urged him to, to veto it, but he signed it, which means in Oregon, uh, political ads can be but completely he's a anonymous. Wasn't he a Democrat? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> he was elected as a Democrat. That's correct. Okay. Um, now, 11 other states not only have disclosure of, you know, that says this ad was, was um, you know, placed by such and such, but these states, 11 other states require that the ads identify in the political ads themselves the largest funders of the ad. Yes. And here's a list of those states that include uh, California and uh, Washington, among others. The, um, the effect of including uh, the, in a political ad, and requiring that political ads identify their top funders is a very important reform. It was part of the Multnomah County initiative mm -hmm. that you mentioned a minute ago right. that we'll be turning to in a second. The, um, California has that law, has had that law for some time. And in 2014, uh, it was that law that prevented Chevron Corporation from take, essentially taking over the city of Richmond, California. Chevron has a large refinery in Richmond and it had a, uh, experienced a series of explosions and toxic gas releases. So the, uh, the city council of Richmond was considering, you know, requiring Chevron to at least notify the city when a toxic gas cloud was, was about to be, you know, about to be released. So uh, Richmond in 2014 decided to take over the city government instead. And so they ran, they recruited and ran their own candidates for mayor and for all of the seats of the city council. And they spent $3 million promoting those candidates. Richmond as a city is only about 110,000 people. So $3 million campaign, they outspent their opponents by a factor of 50. But California law required that their billboards and their brochures and their, and their, and their ads on TV and radio um, indicate who the major funder of the, of the ad advertisement okay. was. And so every one of their ads had to say, major funder, Chevron, Inc., Outspent, they spent massively outspent their opponents, and every one of Chevron's candidates overwhelmingly lost because their ads had to indicate that they were the candidate uh, of Chevron. Okay, okay. Now yeah. Imagine that in Oregon. Imagine yeah. in Oregon, if uh, the the candidate had to say in the in the in the candidate's ad mm -hmm. that the major funders were, um, uh, you know, Georgia Pacific, Dow Chemical. And you know whatever, okay. Nike. Okay. Let's let's be realistic. Probably okay. Nike. <laughs> okay. okay. Probably Nike. But um, so that's another important reform. We've um, we got those these reforms, limits on contributions, and uh, taglines in political ads 
that was passed in 2016 by Multnomah County voters mm -hmm. for Multnomah County elections. Mm -hmm. Only 89% voted yes. 89%. 89% voted yes. 11% were holdouts. Um, 89%. The, um, the provisions of that charter amendment, it's a charter amendment, so the, or, so the Multnomah County Commission can't change it. Okay. This is an important part of reform. They can't uh, change Campaign it. finance, right. You need to make campaign finance changes in the county charter or in the city charter or in the Oregon Constitution. So the, the commissions, the elected commissions or the elected legislature can't change it because they're elected under a big money system. They don't want reform. If you allow, if you pass just a statute or an ordinance mm -hmm. that the commission or the legislature can change, you're asking for trouble. Uh, the, the people of Massachusetts some time ago enacted a, a public funding system for mm -hmm. their campaigns. So the Massachusetts legislature then refused to fund it. Okay. When they, the people sued the legislature, and actually the, the Supreme Court of Massachusetts ordered that the legislators' cars, automobiles, would be, would be um, seized and sold mm -hmm. to provide funds for the public funding campaign since they weren't funding it. And so the uh, Massachusetts legislature, the most you know, reputed to be the most liberal legislature in America, got together and repealed the whole system on a voice vote, so none of them could be held responsible. Hmm. The same thing happened in Missouri, when Missouri uh, adopted campaign limits by initiative. Same thing happened in South Dakota just last year. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. Yeah. 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 So you have to change the charter. We changed the charter. We prohibited contributions by corporations and other entities. We limit any individual, any candidate receiving $500 from any individual or political committee. We created the, the concept of the small donor committee, which can accept only contributions uh, from individuals in amounts of $100 or less, and they can then contribute those funds to candidates or spend them as they wish. And it requires that the five largest true original sources of funds be prominently disclosed on all political advertisements. Mm. That went into effect in Multnomah County, for Multnomah County elections on September 1st of last year. Mm. Okay. Um, it was widely supported by political par minor parties, Progressive Party, Green Party, Working Families Party. It was supported by NAACP, the Sierra Club, the Teamsters, uh, a wide variety of folks, uh, and including, strangely enough, the Multnomah County Democratic Party. Mm -hmm. The major opponent of campaign finance reform in Oregon is the statewide Democratic Party. The statewide Democratic, Democratic Party. They not only don't adopt campaign finance reform in the Oregon legislature. It has never adopted limits on contributions. It has re only repealed disclosure requirements. It has several times repealed contribution limits that were adopted by voters. It repealed them in 1973, it repealed them in 1997. Um, so they not only do that, but the Democratic Party and its operatives routinely intervene when it comes to folks who are trying to put measures on the ballot for campaign mm -hmm. finance reform. They intervene to challenge ballot titles. They intervene to file lawsuits. So the Democratic Party is the major opponent of campaign finance mm -hmm. reform in Oregon. Interesting. Um, we now have, before we get to this, this uh, city measure, um, we have a uh, we have underway on the state level for the year 2020 an initiative petition to amend the Oregon Constitution okay. to enable these kinds of reforms that we've been talking about. We were going to do this in 2018, but of course the, the former uh, executive director of the Democratic Party of Oregon filed a ballot title challenge, which is currently in the Oregon Supreme Court. The Oregon Supreme Court is uh, typically now taking four months to decide ballot title challenges, which mm -hmm. means if you want to do an initiative, you go out, draft the initiative and file it, then you go out and collect at least a thousand signatures, submit the signatures, get them verified by the Secretary of State, and then that starts the ballot title process. Mm -hmm. So you have to collect the thousand signatures and then stop. Mm. Wait for the ballot title process. It takes a month, ballot title process, unless someone files a challenge to the ballot, ballot title, which is written by the Attorney General of the state, unless someone files a challenge in the Supreme Court. And the former executive director of the Democratic Party of Oregon did file the challenge. And so we're, uh, briefs have been filed in the Supreme Court. Um, of course, they ask for an extension of time to file their reply brief. So it's all a matter of delay, 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 keep people off the street so they can't collect signatures. So um, we may have to go, if that stays in the Supreme Court long enough, we may have to go with the, year, with the initiative in the year 2020 
and we'll be able to start collecting signatures on that um, in July of this year. So we'll mm -hmm. have two full years to collect uh, those signatures. And it, when you have a, a campaign that is primarily volunteer, volunteers collecting signatures, it takes quite a long time mm -hmm. to collect them, to collect the, the number that you need for a constitutional amendment. You need, what, about 115,000 valid signatures, which means um, exactly. you probably need to collect 170,000 mm -hmm. mm -hmm. uh, raw signatures. Mm -hmm. Now, on the state, on the city level, um, we've taken the, the measure that county voters um, enacted that I mentioned a minute ago, and we have filed that as a Port city of Portland initiative okay. um, uh, to amend the, the Portland city charter to do that. And um, that we got our ballot title a couple of days ago, pretty good from the city attorney, pretty good ballot title. And um, we we'll, should probably be able to start collecting signatures on that fairly soon. And we need about 30, 4,000 valid signatures by July 6th okay. of, in this order, year. of this year in order to of put it on right, the November right, ballot. Right, 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 right. And um, I think it, if it goes on the ballot, um, it will win over, probably win overwhelmingly. It's, okay. it's the same, almost the same electorate that passed the Multnomah County measure mm -hmm. by 89%. In the city of Portland itself, that measure passed by 90%. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So... Mm -hmm. What what would be the downside in terms of as for now the candidates are running now, mm -hmm. okay, and and I've gotten some calls along that line, in that um, some were saying, well, gee whiz, Bruce, uh, uh, it's going to take me three flyers, if you will, to run for city council, okay? Three flyers. Uh, three flyers. Oh, flyers. Flyers. I'm sorry, three flyers, and um, at, at the cost of about maybe ten to fifteen thousand dollars each, mm -hmm. okay. So that means now they're going to have to go out and pick up, you know, normally they, the, the, the normal way has been basically uh, the, the corporation, like you were saying, they were doing 1,000, 2,000, 10,000, that type of stuff. And then they're trying to figure out, well, okay, fine, they can't do that anymore. And so now I've got to do it at 500 bucks a shot. Right. You got me? And uh, and then sometimes there's, there's game playing with that too, right? You know, like trying to find out maybe what, can they can they go to one corporation? Let's say we, in the, in the past we were giving somebody like fifteen thousand. They can say, okay, fine, uh, we'll just break it down and have individual uh, whatever employees or whatever break it down to five hundred bucks each. Can they do that? Um, is there any way of preventing that? There is nothing that um, prevents an individual from contributing five hundred dollars. Okay. And so a corporation can certainly encourage its executives or employees to contribute. They cannot, under Oregon state law, um, provide any benefit or detriment to an employee who mm -hmm. does or does not contribute. It, that's called the undue influence statute. Mm -hmm. So you can't say you have, to, you have to contribute money to a political campaign or you're fired. Or mm -hmm. you also can't say if you contribute... $500 to a political campaign will give you a $500 bonus. That's mm -hmm. that's already mm -hmm. illegal under Oregon state okay. law. Okay. What our city measure does, um, as you, uh, this um, sort of chart indicates, that city elections um, tend to be a lot more expensive than county elections. Right. Okay. Good. Um, okay, there we go. Typically, mayors are now winning mayor mm -hmm. candidates are spending a million dollars or more. Ted mm -hmm. um, Charlie Hale spent about a million and a half dollars. Mm -hmm. Ted Wheeler about a million. And the county uh, folks, the the largest amount yeah, raised and spent was Deborah Kafori, about okay. four hundred and about four hundred sixty six thousand. Mm -hmm. um, so in our city measure, we allow a candidate to receive um, what we are conceiving as as seed money. That is, the first five thousand dollars can okay. be uh, received without limits. Oh, okay. Or the can which means that the candidate could. For example, loan herself the first five thousand yeah, dollars yeah. in order to get going, and so one of the first things that a candidate would do under the under the measures would be to um, start a grassroots fundraising operation okay. in order to obtain contributions of of five hundred dollars or uh, or less from folks. Note that in many states, um, many states have limits that are lower than that. And mm -hmm. the politicians in those states don't seem to have a problem really? in raising enough funds. You'll notice that in uh, Montana, the limit for like legislative races is only $170. Mm -hmm. Colorado, $200, um, et cetera. And for many of these states, um, the limitations on amounts that can be contributed to local races are even less than, than can be contributed to legislators. Mm -hmm. So um, it's really only in a few states, as about six of them, 
where candidates become become dependent upon gigantic contributions as they do in Oregon. Hmm. Um, there is a, see, a little study was done by Osberg um, recently that, that concluded here that um, in uh, Oregon uh, uh, races for candidates that the candidate races are absolutely dominated by contributions of over $5,000 each. This chart shows in-state and out-of-state contributions. The out-of-state are orange, the in-state are blue. The left-hand large uh, bar is large contributions mm -hmm. in the 2016 election cycle, mm -hmm. and the small bar is small contributions, mm -hmm. and they, they draw that line as between over 5,000 and under 5,000. Mm -hmm. So you can see that in Oregon, Oregon politics are absolutely dominated by contributions of over mm -hmm. 5,000, and it's not unusual for individual um, candidates to receive contributions of over $300,000 from a single individual. Mm -hmm. The individuals making those contributions are usually timber company executives mm -hmm. or um, executives of ADEC, which is a medical uh, equipment uh, mm -hmm. supplier, medical equipment manufacturer down in Newburgh, and or Nike. Of course, Nike has, um, uh, Phil Knight contributed, what was it, $250,000 to the Kitts Arbor campaign a few years back, and Kitzhaber then immediately called a special session of the Oregon legislature. Hmm. For what purpose, you ask? <laughs> yeah, what purpose? What was that for? For the Oregon legislature to adopt a law that says we, have, we are signing a contract, a binding contract with Nike, that we will not change the way we tax Nike for 30 years. So it can meet that, 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 that cap piece. Well... So that Nike doesn't have, well, they have to worry about Oregon corporate taxes are are are, are way out of whack. Uh, Oregon uh, taxes Oregon corporations only on the basis of uh, for income only on the basis of their in-state sales, even if they are mm -hmm. a, a worldwide corporation. Mm -hmm. It's it's totally out of line with with the way other states mm -hmm. tax corporation corporate income. But Nike said we want to have that, that special treatment, you know, somehow. Uh, embodied or somehow preserved for 30 years, but you, of course one legislature can't bind what the next legislature does. Mm -hmm. This legislature can't say our tax system is going to be this way, you know, for, I'm sorry, yeah, this way for 20 or 30 years okay. or whatever, but nevertheless the Oregon legislature, um, uh, you know, authorized the, the state of Oregon to sign a contract with Nike, mm -hmm. and so Nike can sue the state of Oregon if it changes its corporate tax system. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that's just, you know, um, that's just one illustration of what happens. But so seed money, you can go, you can, uh, you know, fund the first 5,000 of your campaign, get your grassroots campaign up and yeah. running. Um, with the internet, grassroots campaigns are now, can be funded somewhat more easily than they were before. I mean, um, uh, Bernie Sanders um, raised $250 million uh, in contributions that he, he claimed averaged only $37. Per okay. contribution, okay. it was actually it was somewhat more than that per contributor because a large number of his contributors um, each contributed one dollar <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> on several occasions. So mm. yes, that brings mm. down the average. Mm. Um, mm. But we think that um, the limits of of five hundred per individual is a good limit. Most states have that limit. Um, uh, Washington, for example, um, one thing to note is that. The mayoral races in Washington, in Seattle, call, um, have far lower campaign con uh, expenditures than the mayoral races in Portland. Um, the like by a factor of three or four. Um, and Seattle voters um, in 2015 adopted a law that lowered the limit from um, that. Of course, only individuals can contribute in those con mm -hmm. in those races and lowered that limit from $700 to $500 mm -hmm. so Seattle has the same limit and Seattle also adopted a uh, campaign voucher system right. where um, every registered voter in Seattle receives in the mail four vouchers each voucher is worth $25 and they can assign those vouchers either either uh, in, in writing or electronically by going to a website, they can assign those vouchers to candidates for city council or candidates for mayor. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, so that system is in place. I think it's I think the first election that it's going to affect is probably this year. 
Um, they did send out the vouchers in January a year ago. Mm -hmm. um, so that's a, um, a system of public funding. Of course, Oregon doesn't have that either. The um, Oregon legislature is considering right now a uh, public funding uh, of campaigns um, bill. It uh, received a very favorable hearing a couple of, a few days ago. Mm -hmm. um, it would establish a different kind of system of public funding of campaigns. It would only be for legislative campaigns. It would say that once you've collected, let's say you're running for the Oregon State Senate, once you've collected 400 small contributions from individuals, and small is defined as $250 or less per person, per uh, contributor, that, or all of them have to be less than $250, um, that, sub that those contributions and subsequent small contributions would be matched by state funds on a six to one basis. That is, if you contributed, okay. if, or I contributed $100 to your campaign right. for legislature, okay. the state would kick in $600 on top of that. Oh, really? yeah. Okay. So um, there would be a limit on that kind of match up mm. to a pretty high level. That is a level that is determined by what it has cost in the past, what campaigns okay. have cost in the past for okay. those offices. Okay. So this sort of bill has been proposed in the Oregon legislature for each of the last three or four sessions. Wait a minute. Who's doing this? Which party? Um, oh, it's just kind of neither universal. one. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. It's, oh, yeah. um, it's most idea. of the co-sponsors are Democrats, but of course the Democrats totally control the legislature right, right, right. and they haven't adopted it yet. Mm -hmm. Hmm. Um, the progressive party and the independent party, and I think the green party has already have endorsed the bill. Mm -hmm. Um, and, but we'll see, um, it will, it has to be voted out of committee within a week or so in this, mm -hmm. in this legislative session. Mm -hmm. Now, you know, one, I was just thinking about just another area would be like, for instance, like a flyer kind of. Can a person, can a person and or a corporation can say, okay, fine, I'll, I'll fund the product project as far as the flyers are concerned, meaning that, meaning that, uh, let's say that, the, I'm just saying the cost or whatever might have been $15,000. Mm -hmm. Can't, they can't do that, right? Basically, probably have to do the, the net, what the cost might be in terms of, uh, what the material cost or whatever, whatever, whatever it costs. Right. Under this. Under this and measure, this, this measure here. A, a corporation could not could not contribute fifteen thousand dollars for a flyer, right? If the and could not also produce the flyer itself, okay, which okay. would be an in kind contribution to fifteen thousand dollars. In kind, right? In kind, okay. Right. So there's no in kind stuff in, in this bill. In uh, state law, under state law, in kind contributions are considered contrib the same as cash contributions. Yeah, right, 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 right. So, right. So, so, in, so any contribution that they might have made would be, like you said, would still be that five hundred by five hundred dollar cap would have to be a part of the process. Right, 500 per individual or 500 for, per political committee. And let right. me also mention the important um, provision in the Multnomah measure and in the in the proposed right. Portland measure, and that's small donor committees. Small donors. Small donor committee is a political committee that is that cannot accept contributions from any, any place except from individuals in amounts uh, limited to $100 per individual per, per calendar year. Per calendar year. Calendar year. And such small donor committees can then, you know, are, aggregate the small contributions and then they can spend them any way they want. They can contribute all that money to one candidate. They can take out their own ads as long as the ads identify them. Um, mm -hmm. And, um, or they can you know, contribute the funds to a number of candidates. Hmm. And uh, that's another way for um, candidates in, to raise money, but in, but in small amounts. So if there are uh, civic-minded um, organizations and entities, they can f or persons, they can each form a, they can form small donor committees, receive small contributions, and mm -hmm. um, and fund the campaigns that way. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, getting back to Multnomah County, mm -hmm. as far as the law, now is the law is the law is the law in place now? Uh, yeah, as far as enforcement, yes, it is. The candidates can only, well, actually, the, as far as the. The campaign raising five hundred, the five hundred dollar cap is in in place right now. Yes, it is, and um, uh, of course, your guest from last week, uh, Seth Woolley, is diligently checking the yes. um, campaign finance reports yes, to right. make sure that no one is violating yes. the five hundred dollar limits, and he has found uh, a, a couple of violations of of candidates from Oklahoma County office who accepted contributions of more than five hundred dollars per individual or 
accepted contributions from a corporation, okay. which is not which are not allowed. But each of those candidates, within a day or so, um, recognized that, that that contribution was in violation of the of the new right, charter right. amendment, and so they returned the money to the donors. Okay. Okay. Um, yeah, I think you mentioned that in regards to Deborah. Before, I think Deborah before he had one of those where she had a thousand bucks or something. Yeah. Thousand dollar contribution. She immediately returned half money, of that. Half, to half the money. So she cashed the check and then. Uh, the well, she reported the contribution having been received. <laughs> I don't know if that means she cashed the check. And then. Uh, Maybe and then set, reported, set will know. Reported sending back five hundred. Okay, That's right. Okay. Okay. Well, what other little things that? Because um, uh, like some of the folks are saying, well, gee, was how, how am I going to be running a race? I just can't. I just can't get the small folks to, to, to contribute the monies to me, the 500 bucks or something like that. Uh, well, consider the situation now. I'm just, I'm just asking. These kind of um, consider the situation now. If you're, let's say you want to run for Portland City Council. Right. One problem with that is that uh, all of the members of the city council are elected citywide. Right. Which makes it maybe Very four times more expensive exactly. than if they were elected by district. Exactly. So that's the first problem. Uh, so you need to send out your, your brochures to right. four times as many people. Right. Um, the next problem is that you're going to have an opponent who is funded by the corporations. Mm -hmm. um, one very large source of contributions now for local politicians are corporations that are involved in the Portland Harbor Superfund site. There is a very a large um, proceeding going on at the Environmental Protection Agency and federal courts about who should pay for the cleanup of toxic wastes that are uh, up and down the Willamette River and in the Portland Harbor area okay. that were deposited there by, by, industri by industry over mm -hmm. the past several decades. Mm -hmm. And it's, a, it, it's several billion dollars are at stake there. And um, many of the industries want the city of Portland to pay that. To tax taxpayer, to tax us, the taxpayers, to pay for cleanup of, of the mess that they left. Mm. Um, so that's now a large source of contributions. So let's say you're running for city council. Mm -hmm. you're, um, right now, you're going to face a candidate who's automatically got 500000 to a million dollars in his pocket Even. from the corporations. Now, do you think you can beat that? Oh, no way. So wouldn't, wouldn't you rather compete with that candidate in order to obtain small contributions mm -hmm. and, uh, and run on that basis? Mm -hmm. um, I, 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 I would. I, oh yes, very much. So I can see it. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. Any other thing that you think uh, we might want to share with the one of those potential folks who are interested in running for office, and and the uh, again the, the beneficiary area uh, to the public as a whole, and and to the issues that say of concern. The idea we 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 definitely want to get the folks at the table that's going to respond to the issues as far as concerns and solutions. Right. Fair. Right. Yeah. One. Th one thing, on. you know, Oregon's uh, campaign finance uh, Wild West system really um, belies Oregon's reputation as, as a progressive state. That's really a myth. Oregon is not a progressive state. Mm -hmm. it, it's not even progressive when it comes to, you know, environmental protection, which is, you know, seems to be Oregon's calling card. Mm -hmm. You know, my goodness, we have open beaches and all sorts of wonderful things like that. But in fact, we have very terrible environmental policies. And this, this slide just indicates one example. I have a whole series of them, but just a local mm -hmm. example is that probably not many people know. This is, of course, what Donald Trump always says. Not many people know this. Yeah, okay, okay, okay. <laughs> not many people know that health care is very complicated. Mm -hmm. Not many people know that Oregon, that Multnomah County Air is now ranked in the worst 1% of all counties nationwide for contributions of diesel particulate. And it's in the worst 2% for cancer risks from air pollution. Mm -hmm. Portland is the worst city nationwide in respiratory distress. This was from the EPA National Air Toxics Assessment from about two years ago. Um, how can that be? Well, the corporations are the ones who are putting out the pollutions or pollution are also the ones that are controlling the legislature and local government. Diesel. Oregon is an extremely bad state when it comes to controlling diesel emissions. California and Washington have both banned dirty diesel engines, those that were built before the year 2008, can't use them. So companies with those diesel engines, trucks and stationary diesel engines in Washington, sell their, their bad, their polluting diesel engines into Oregon. Mm -hmm. Oregon lets them run. Hmm. So, you know, Oregon is uh, uh, an outlier now on the West Coast when it comes to environmental issues. 
Oregon is the yeah. weak link, yeah. uh, and it's I think it's because of the campaign finance system. Oregon is by is like the non-existent link when it comes mm -hmm. to campaign uh, finance regulation. Um, um, California and Washington both have limits on contributions. They both have, require that political ads identify their top donors. Uh, I, I was listening to a uh, political ad the other day in Washington that said, you know, this ad was paid for by Bill Gates. <laughs> <laughs> so um, uh, Oregon's way behind, and um, we need to, and, and the only way to um, bring Oregon back to some level of democracy is to is through ballot measures, mm -hmm. and so that's what, that's what um, the Progressive Party is doing, the Green Party is doing, the Independent Party is doing, um, and we hope that people will join the campaign. Let's find a we'll we can't find the, the, con, the go to honest-elections.com okay honest-elections.com and you'll find all of the information all the information on the, on the page well, we just got to discuss that's right okay good that sounds good well again one more thing for clarity uh, the point is that the law was passed for the Multnomah County, right? Yes. Okay, good. And this this so-called legal deal is that a repeal process aspect of it? Oh, there is what a. What about the implementation? There is a a validation proceeding. A in validation, court which which underway. Means, which means uh, any county can ask the circuit court to validate a, a statute, um, and that means that the court decides whether it's you know valid or not under the Oregon Constitution. So that proceeding began uh, last summer. All the briefing was done last summer, and it has been at the M Multnomah County Circuit Court since then. We sort of expected a decision by September, but that hasn't happened yet. Okay, okay. Um, and so once the Multnomah County Circuit Court decides the matter, the whoever loses there can appeal that to the Oregon Court of Appeals, um, and the loser there can ask for a review in the Oregon Supreme Court, um, in the meantime, this, the measure is fully in effect. It's in effect. In effect. Okay, 500 bucks cap, right? Yep. And then you got the small donors, right? And small Please, donor right. committees. And the 5,000 bucks for the for the person who's running for office, right? Not for Multnomah County. Not for Multnomah County yet. What 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 are the, what, what options do you give them to a certain degree? Uh, in Multnomah County, you can receive contributions from individuals <laughs> of $500 or less, or you can. Um, receive contributions from small donor committees. And, and was that 110 bucks? What was that? And the small donor committee can accept contributions from individuals of $100 per right. year. And that's basically putting it together. That has to be a legal committee, right? It has to be a political committee political under committee Oregon law. Under Oregon right? law. And then you go through the Secretary of State's office where that take it, right? That's right. Oh, is it my donor, right? That way? Secretary oh, okay, of State. Good. Okay. And the minimum number of the committee? The minimum number of folks in that committee? How many? One. One, two, three, five, ten. I'm just thinking about the committee. You were thinking about the small donor committee. Um, I'm not understanding your question. Okay, I'm I'm just saying, trying to raise the money as opposed to the 500 bucks, mm -hmm. you can get small donor committees, right? Right. Okay, at 100, what's it, 100, 150? 100 dollars per person. 100 per, per, year. per person. Right. Well, what's the composition of that that committee? How many people? The committee can be as as many people as it wants. Okay. One, okay. I just, two, I'm, three, I'm just trying to get some little clarification with that. Right. Okay. Good. Good. Well, hey, that sounds good. Uh, I think you've answered a number of questions. In fact, Bruce is sitting out there and. Uh, any questions, Bruce? You got anything? Any idea? <laughs> did you get the, Did you get the message? <laughs> well, did you? Or didn't you? Yeah, I'm not. I'm not taking any money from corporations. I'm, I'm, it's all individuals. Basically. Okay. 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 Set anything that you want to? You, you, you okay? You okay? Good. Okay. So I think we we covered it quite a, quite a bit. What do you think? So far, so good. Yeah. And so you're, we're pr planning on maybe taking this throughout the state of Oregon. I take it right. We're starting right here in in the Portland metropolitan area. Um, yes, Portland seems to be a receptive, so we'll, we're trying to get the Portland measure on the ballot for this November, and probably because of the opposition and the um, interference in the initiative process by the um, former executive director of the Democratic Party of Oregon, prob we may well not be able to do a statewide measure until the year 2020. 2020? Mm -hmm. Wow, that's, that's quite a bit of ways. Interesting. Mm -hmm. Oh, one question I didn't ask you. What about repercussions if, if, if they violate this law? Let's say if Endeavor didn't... didn't uh, I, what about that situation? Um, what, what happens then? Violations of uh, the limits are punishable by fines. I believe it's not less than two times or more than 20 times the amount of the violation. Mm. So if, uh, if, 
a, you accept the contribution of $1,000, then the fine can be anywhere from $2,000 to $20,000. One question is uh, how that gets enforced. Mm -hmm, right. We have proposed to the Multnomah County Commission that they adopt an enforcement ordinance, which they have not done. Mm -hmm. So now the only process for enforcement is to for an individual to file a complaint with the Multnomah County Election Office or with the county attorney, and there's, and there's no established yeah. process yeah, for yeah, handling right, yeah, the complaint. Yeah. That's another process we have to go through. Um, if, the complaint, if, if the complaint is denied, then the complainer can go to Multnomah County Circuit Court and basically make an evidentiary showing there. So it's not... Yeah, it's not bad. Okay. That's not a bad a bad system. I think it, it it would be better to have more clarity. However, okay, okay, good. But well, besides besides going to the internet on your piece, mm -hmm. who else can they go at the county and get information or background as far as background on this issue? Who can they go to at the county? That's who, can go, who can they go to? The, do they go to the attorney or do they maybe go to the chair or what? What? Who, who can they go to to say, okay, fine, look here, I've got a question. Oh, if you have a question about it, then contact the county attorney. The county attorney. Right. Okay, county attorney, just to make sure that it's cleaned up. Yes. Okay, good. I take it we've got about 24 seconds here right now. Am I right? That's right. I guess I got, that's it. Okay, fine. Well, Dan, this has been great. A lot of good information. I think it's very important because that needs to have been discussed, trust me. Because a lot of folks, we've got what is that, March 6th coming up. Mm -hmm. That's when the door closed. So those folks who potentially might want to be candidates, they need to know what this law is all about. Right. Yeah? March 6th is the deadline for filing for Sounds candidacy. Great. Thank, thanks very much, Dan. All right. It's a pleasure. Always a pleasure. Okay. Same yeah. here. Okay, folks, you got it. I'll see you next week for another guest. Have a good one. Hey folks, I'm Bruce Broussard, and as you might know, I'm running to be your next county commissioner, but I will continue to host our Oregon Voters Digest and will likely share my views on important issues here. And since this is going to be a very important election year for everyone, I'm opening this platform for other political candidates to share their views too. So, if whether you're also running for a Multnomah County Commissioner or if you are going to be on the ballot in any other position in our viewing area, you are welcome to come on this show and tell us what you are all about. This is an open invitation to anyone running for any office in the Portland area. We broadcast our show live every Sunday afternoon here in Northeast Portland and would love to share the stage with you. If you're interested, send us an email at ovdguests at gmail.com. The email should be displayed on your screen now. So, come on down. Write me an email and tell me who you are, what position you're running for, and maybe a little about yourself. Again, our email is ovdguess at gmail.com. Even if you're not running for office, be sure to stay tuned over the next several months. You're going to want to know how your candidates stand on the issues and how they plan to represent you. Have a great week, folks. Everybody, I love you. Take care.